um, some organizational information at the very beginning. Please note that the webinar will be recorded. Um, if you intend to ask questions, and please feel encouraged to do so, you can always type the questions in the chat or uh, raise a hand after the speaker's presentation. There will always be some time for your questions and for the discussion. Um, the materials from the event will be available to you. We will send out the link to the recording and uh, all the materials like slides uh, to registered participants by email. And also, um, please be so kind to fill out the evaluation survey that we will send out right after the event. It's very important for us to uh, get the feedback from you to know how you enjoy the seminar and maybe what you would like to see in the future seminars. Um, so I believe that you've already seen the program. The first speaker is uh, Martin Vavra. Uh, he's a researcher, but also an employee of the Czech Social Science Data Archive. He cooperates on various international projects within the data infrastructure, and he's also in charge of data acquisition. Today, he will give you a very brief introduction into the CSDA and SESDA and various data sources that relate to the environment and ecology in uh, general. Um, so please, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michaela, for introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. Before the main presenters start, uh, I will talk briefly about data uh, archives more generally and mainly about uh, data discovery because uh, uh, both presenters uh, will talk, I suppose, uh, about concrete uh, data sets, but uh, there are many more available uh, data sets uh, related to topics like uh, consumption, uh, environment, environmental attitudes, and uh, so on. So uh, let's start. Uh, uh, what the data archives uh, in social sciences are? Uh, yeah, this has organizations uh, which uh, are active uh, in. Uh, data acquisition uh, in data description and mainly what is most important for researchers, they are active in data dissemination. Uh, we are trying, uh, and when I say we, uh, I mean not only uh, Czech social science data archives in uh, which uh, I work, but uh, all uh, data archives uh, in SESDA organization and uh, probably uh, I will I talk about uh, all uh, data archives I know uh, that uh, the goal is uh, to make data available for uh, further research. Here is a model of uh, data curation. Uh, it's uh, uh, quite complicated, but what is important, uh, according uh, to me, is that. Uh, uh, the process of data curation uh, is not only about uh, data archives, uh, but uh, uh, data curation, data management, data uh, process, data going through life cycle uh, uh, should be uh, taken in account at all uh, stages of data processing. So from the uh, very first uh, start of uh, some research project, it should be kept in mind that at the end, ideally, uh, should be uh, some data set uh, which uh, should be uh, made available for uh, further research. Uh, so it's not only uh, upon us to make data available, but it's uh, uh, upon you as well as the researchers because. Uh, we can make data available only in case uh, when we get the data and uh, when we are able uh, to describe data properly and uh, then to make uh, the data sets available uh, through our online uh, portal. Um, very brief uh, 
info on uh, Czech social science data archives. Probably most of you uh, uh, knows uh, this uh, this archive. Uh, we have now more than a uh, thousand of uh, data sets coming mostly from the field of sociology and the uh, vast majority of the data uh, is available through uh, our online catalog for uh, registered users. We are part of uh, European uh, data uh, organization SESDA, which became part of European science infrastructure. And uh, now uh, 23 uh, European uh, states are members of, of uh, the SESDA. In each state, uh, there is uh, one national node of this, of this infrastructure. Uh, there are quite many SESDA activities, but uh, for researchers, uh, probably two of uh, them are most important. First, uh, first is uh, Data Management Expert Guide. It's online tool uh, which uh, can be used as a guide uh, for uh, data management uh, when you need to prepare some data management plan or uh, when you need to know something more about uh, how to prepare data uh, for long-term preservation, uh, you can use this, uh, this guide. And the second uh, important, uh, important uh, activity of SESDA is a data catalog, because uh, it would be quite difficult to go uh, through uh, all the uh, 23 uh, data collections even uh, if they are online. Uh, so this uh, online data catalog serves as a uh, one-stop shop or one page, uh, one uh, uh, search tool, uh, which you can use uh, for searching through all the member archives. The data uh, are still kept in individual archives, but metadata are in this, uh, uh, says the data catalog with uh, one, one place. Um, how to find data on ecological consumption, uh, production, environment, attitudes, and so on. Uh, so uh, there are many ways, but, and uh, probably again, uh, most of you uh, uh, knows these uh, ways how to uh, find data, but yeah, you can use a uh, data management expert guide, where is chapter on data discovery, I think quite well prepared. And uh, you can use some uh, general search tools. Uh, probably most general is Google dataset search. It's uh, some sub uh, tool or sub page of uh, general, uh, general uh, search tool of Google which is uh, searching through internet uh, and uh, returning only what is identified by the tool as a data set. And uh, the second is GIS's data search tool. Uh, it's uh, less general because it's not searching uh, through all the internet, but it's uh, searching only through uh, uh, data which are registered uh, in GIS's not only through uh, data which are uh, physically or electronically located in GIS, but uh, uh, because GIS has uh, 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 agency DARA, which is uh, agency for uh, um, registering uh, uh, data sets, electronic data sets. Uh, so this search tool uh, now contains some 80,000 of, of data sets uh, uh, from various uh, fields of um, social sciences. Um, there are general repositories too, uh, like Zenodo, which is probably uh, most well known, but uh, there is Fixshare located in Great Britain, but uh, uh, getting uh, or uh, making acquisition of data uh, worldwide, there is for example, DRIAD, which is more uh, popular in uh, life sciences and so on. So we can use these repositories uh, 
for uh, data discovery process uh, and you can use these repositories for uh, repositing uh, your own data because uh, uh, at least Zenodo, which I know best, is uh, based on uh, self-archiving data. So it's uh, up to you upon your activity to describe the data and to upload them into the uh, Zenodo. And uh, there are social science uh, uh, domain repositories uh, in Europe, uh, as I was uh, talking about, are uh, SESDA member archives, in my opinion. And uh, it, there is a difference between, for example, Zenodo and uh, SESDA archives, because Zenodo is uh, based uh, on uh, activity of researchers, on self-archiving of data, but uh, uh, most of the uh, SESDA archives uh, still uh, provide some support of researcher in process of archiving. They have some creation services, so uh, it has some advantages, uh, but uh, on the contrary, uh, the Zenodo uh, can find uh, quite a huge amount of, of data of, uh, from various uh, branches of science. Uh, this is uh, a screenshot from uh, SESDA data catalog. I mentioned before, you can try to search through it, uh, to use some uh, filters, and try find uh, some uh, relevant data. This is a data catalog of uh, German uh, Gieses Institute. Uh, it's not uh, important uh, because it's, uh, it contains a lot of uh, data on Germany, but um, it's uh, important mainly because uh, as a large archive, it uh, uh, takes care and it uh, make uh, public uh, many international data sets uh, from uh, soci sociological surveys and uh, public opinion polls on uh, European or even worldwide uh, level. So, uh, for example, when you need to uh, get uh, data from international social survey program, um, very important uh, survey uh, series, which is uh, uh, among other topics uh, concentrated on environment. Uh, so you can go to this uh, ESIS uh, uh, Institute catalog, uh, register online and uh, download uh, integrated data set for uh, 40, 50 countries. It depends on the wave, how many countries participated, but it's a huge uh, data set covering uh, each continent. Uh, another uh, important uh, uh, survey series uh, located in um, uh, data, which has uh, data sets uh, located in uh, Gizes is uh, Eurobarometer, European level uh, public opinion poll uh, or European blue study, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, covering uh, uh, many uh, areas uh, covering values related to many areas like family or work, but uh, there is uh, there are environmental values and attitudes as well. And uh, yeah, uh, we can mention European Social Survey as well, uh, because uh, especially in round eight, which uh, was uh, collected uh, in 2018 or 16, 2016. Uh, there is a big part dedicated to uh, climate change, knowledge about climate uh, change, global warming uh, and attitudes uh, towards it, uh, so on. Uh, this is a screenshot of uh, uh, CSDA uh, online catalog. Uh, so you can find uh, some uh, environmental uh, 
relevant data uh, there as well. Uh, so there is uh, recently there was added uh, survey uh, forms and the values of alternative economic practices in the Czech Republic. It's only in Czech, but uh, I mention it uh, because uh, Jan Vávra uh, will be talking about uh, this uh, this survey or data data uh, from it. Uh, we keep uh, a lot of public opinion polls uh, from the Public Opinion Research Center. And uh, in these uh, polls, uh, they are uh, quite many uh, topical uh, modules, uh, batteries of questions targeted at uh, environmental attitudes and behavior. Here you can see uh, the right. Uh, in Czech, uh, some uh, examples, uh, some blocks of questions uh, about uh, um, food or perception of, of uh, uh, trees or um, woods and uh, so on. Uh, yeah, and you can find in our data catalog uh, Czech versions of uh, ISSP and uh, EVS. I was talking with, uh, before. Um, it uh, can be uh, quite uh, interesting for somebody because, uh, at least in the case of ISSP, they are some uh, more Czech specific questions than in uh, international data set because Czech researchers uh, edit uh, some Czech specific questions. Uh, in each uh, wave uh, of ISSP and uh, it pays for uh, environment uh, targeted ISSP as well. And you can use a search tool in uh, our data archive to uh, find more data relevant for you. So if you go to our online catalog, you can try searching uh, using keywords or uh, using some uh, words you expect in uh, uh, question wording and uh, probably you will find some something interesting for you. So uh, it's all for now. Thank you. Thank you for this crash course into CSDA and SESTA and also um, what data uh, either Czech or international we can find. Um, are there maybe any questions at this point? I know that this was maybe a bit too general, but maybe someone has any questions or maybe Martin will stick around for a little longer. Um, if someone, or you can contact us uh, at CSDA by email uh, if there's something that you want to ask us, but you're maybe too shy for the chat or asking directly. So if there's no other questions, because I can't see any raised hands and nothing in the chat, um, I will introduce Jan Vavra. Um, who works uh, in the Department of Local and Regional Studies of the Institute of Sociology of the Czech Academy of Sciences. He's an environmental sociologist um, and he's dealing mostly with the social health and environmental context of gardening as informal food production. And he will tell you a little bit more about sociological insights into the food gardening in the heart of Europe. Um, so please uh, feel free to tell us more. So hello everybody. Uh, thank you Michaela for the introduction and thanks to all for coming here to uh, uh, listen to this uh, webinar. I will start my screen, my sharing of my screen, hopefully. And uh, yeah. So I hope that you can see it. And if there will be any technical problem, <clears throat> please tell me and stop me. 
So uh, I, I labeled my uh, presentation sociological insights into the food gardening in the, in the heart of Europe. But in fact, it will be wider than like only sociological because this is a, a topic uh, which uh, can be seen from a various, uh, various viewpoints. So now, yeah, yeah, okay, now it works. So very briefly uh, about uh, my presentation. I think it uh, will be, uh, it won't be very long. So there will be time for questions and, and discussions like some very particular issues. I will start a bit uh, with the context of food gardening. And then uh, introduce uh, the data source, uh, describe some of the data and uh, what is the questionnaire about. And then I have chosen three examples of the data analysis, what we have already done with, uh, with uh, my colleagues. And uh, for illustration of uh, how we can use these data to for which uh, sociological and academic discussions for for which uh, problems and uh, then i will continue and and conclude this uh, this talk with uh, some takeaways like wider takeaways about uh, about home gardening and food production and uh, i will try to highlight even the themes which could be uh, analyzed uh, with this data, because there is quite a lot, I would say, uh, already available topics, issues, questions, and so and so on. So, really, gardening. Uh, when using the word gardening, uh, what do we mean in this talk and usually in our in our research? So, when I say gardening. I, I mean food growing by non-professional farmers. You can find a different uh, terminology. Uh, for example, in our team, uh, we very often use food self-provisioning. Uh, in literature, you will often find informal food production, like in the opposition of the market or professional formal food production. You can find horticulture, like both for this hobby gardening, uh, but horticulture is also for uh, professional gardening. Sometimes you can find subsistence or subsistence farming and, and so on and so on. Typically, especially in European contexts, uh, we talk about home gardens, allotment gardens, sometimes community gardens or weekend, weekend house gardens. So that's... Uh, in Czech context, uh, it's uh, the most typical are home gardens. So is it important topic? Well, I think it is because uh, gardening or informal food production, usually for your family or for some uh, network of your friends, neighbors, relatives, it's very, very common not only in the like global south countries uh, where it's like an important part of the of the economy or the household's economy but it's very common even in the global north or we can say rich countries and uh, i have selected only some research I, I know not not all and we can see it in europe in the, like a cross cut uh, from united kingdom scotland luxembourg germany to uh, Hungary, Slovakia, Moldova, Russia. Uh, gardening has been studied in, in Canada, in the United States, in Latin America, in Australia. Very recently, there is very interesting research on, on home gardening. So there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of uh, research around the world. And uh, gardening uh, is important topic of uh, uh, various uh, academic debates. Uh, it could be used in debates about the food sovereignty, not only food sufficiency, but also food sovereignty, our right to choose our own food. In the debate about alternative food networks and the sustainability of food systems, 
in a very hot topic of urban agriculture. So gardening is a part of uh, food, in fact, in of food systems almost around all the world and could be seen and analyzed and debated in, a, in a very different ways. Very briefly, uh, what are the positive aspects of, uh, of gardening? This is, I think, very useful uh, way how to discuss about uh, gardening, especially in the cities. So the research shows that gardening is linked to the physical activity, to higher well-being, to consumptions of healthy food. From our, let's say, primary uh, social science perspective, uh, gardening is connected to uh, social connections. It can, it has potential to strengthen social ties, to improve and and uh, local community, uh, to maintain and develop cultural aspects. I've already talked about food sovereignty. Uh, some research also views gardening as some kind of alternative to the dominant market system. And, and so on, and that I will get back to, to these two. Uh, we can uh, talk about environmental issues, which are generally positive as well. Uh, not only that gardening can, maybe this is, uh, this is different. It, uh, it's not always, but if done in some way, if, if, with some gardening management, it can improve biodiversity. Almost uh, every time it provides a range of ecosystem services. Uh, very often we talk about climate adaptation, but uh, we can also talk about the climate mitigation through uh, decreasing of CO2 emissions of, uh, of our food production. And uh, one specific which I have highlighted and we'll talk about it uh, in a while, is a resilience of food systems, mostly in the, in the urban areas, which is not only like environmental resilience in, in terms of let's say climate adaptation, but a resilience of a social systems, uh, of a social bonds or a resilience in the perspective of uh, food suffici sufficiency and ability to cope with some disruptions. So that's, that's another uh, another topic. And now I will get more into the uh, into the particular data. S sorry, <laughs> first before this very briefly, I will just uh, show the Czech context, which uh, I think most uh, 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 visitors now are from Czechia, but uh, for the for the more global audience. From the global point of view, Czechia is a fairly rich country, OECD, United European member, uh, on the top of uh, Human Development Index, 32nd position in the whole world in, in last year. Uh, and uh, what you can see on the figures is the, the development in last 20 years. So we see that the, the wealth like the general wealth or the size of economy in, in GDP is growing. Uh, on the bottom right, it's uh, increase of uh, average month salary. And on the upper right is uh, contrary to this like lowering unemployment rate. So in year 2015, which is the year of the data I will present, we are uh, in like in the middle of some like economically very positive trend in, in the country. And so it's a, it's good to to have this uh, have this context in, in mind, I think. So the data itself uh, were collected as a part of the project uh, labeled forms and norms of alternative economic practices in the Czech Republic led by Nadia Johanisová. Uh, she's an ecological economist uh, at Faculty of Social Science at Masaryk University. And the whole project was funded by Czech Science Agency. 
it has it was a like wider project and the main uh, part of the project was a questionnaire uh, with over 2000 respondents uh, representative uh, population for Czech adult uh, like population the data were collected in a, in a two waves in in April May and then in June 2015 by the focus marketing and social research company from Brno and it was done in a in face to face uh, interviews so the data selection was uh, quota selection with the typical quota gender age education municipality size and region with uh, over 20 minutes in uh, in average for one uh, for one questionnaire data are not weighted and uh, are uh, like quite uh, in my from my point of view and according to my experience the data are like quite good in terms of their uh, reliability and representativeness and, and so on what's very important I'm the one who is presenting this now, but I wasn't the one who was in the beginning of the project. I jumped into the car, like in, in the middle. So I did not uh, design the, the questionnaire. It was done by the PI of the, of the project, Nadia Johanisova, and her colleague Petra Jehlička, who is, I think, uh, also here today online, Petr Daniak and Eva Frankova. So these are these are those people who should be credited for this uh, for this uh, research mostly. So and what was in the in the questionnaire? So as Martin uh, Vavra said in the beginning, the the data are already in the in the in the Czech social data archive. So you can uh, you can have a look um, on your own. In generally. There's a, there are questions on a food self provisioning and food sharing, but also about other ways of sharing and help. I will talk mostly about food, but uh, the the questionnaire and uh, and the project is is wider, much much wider than than this. So there there are questions on uh, who, where, how much, how. Uh, gardens uh, in you know aspects of uh, food self provisioning then there is a set of questions on food sharing again who shares food with whom how much food is shared and similarly for uh, the other sharing and help which includes borrowing uh, and sharing of things you know helping with some activities non paid work uh, the question of uh, compensations for this help and uh, some questions on, uh, on financial support and lending money. For both these uh, parts, like food and non-food support, there are questions on motivations, why people do this. Uh, there are also interesting uh, questions on a geography, not only geography where people live, but uh, geographic aspects of the, of the networks, you know, for example, who are the people that uh, the respondents help to or who are the people and where do they live with whom the food is shared so you can trace some you know uh, traveling of food and, and so on there is interesting uh, set of few questions on the changes in a, in a food production sharing a help and living standard in the last 10 years you know whether the people uh, are better off uh, than they used to used to be and whether uh, they share or grow more food or activities than they, they used to be. There is a set of questions on values, I think inspired by the, the classical Schwartz, uh, Schwartz uh, typology of values. And there is uh, regular socio-demographic uh, questions uh, including income and, and all, the, all the typical sociodemographics, which is uh, connected with one uh, issue uh, that uh, people should keep in mind 
when uh, analyzing and interpreting the food growing uh, and, and food consumption data that uh, the sociodemographics are individual questions. You know, one person in household is, uh, is being asked, but the food provisioning itself is usually collective. So sometimes we use it, we use the sociodemographic, of course, in the analysis, but uh, we, we have to be uh, in some way kind of uh, uh, aware about some limitations when interpreting this, uh, because it is usually collective activity of the whole household. So in the first case, I have chosen three already published papers. So the first case to illustrate which, which data we have and what could be done with it. Uh, Rethinking Resilience, Home Gardening, Food Sharing and Everyday Resistance is a paper from the journal, Canadian Journal of Development Studies. And uh, I, only, I only show a few tables and numbers to illustrate this. Uh, in general, uh, the, the first number I, I usually talk about is the amount of people who grow. So in this uh, research, it was 38% of adult population grow at least some food. In a long-term uh, perspective, the, the number is uh, around 40% for last, uh, I think 20 years in, in the country. You know, So it's, very, it's kind of like a very stable very stable and if you have a look on this uh, on this table on a in a in a rows you see some type the types of uh, food so it's also important uh, that we mostly focused uh, the data are, are mostly focused on uh, vegetables fruits uh, potatoes and there were also questions eggs meat and honey but our interpretation mostly dealt with uh, the vegetables and fruits and potatoes. So it's not about the like a complete self-sufficiency of baking bread and, and things like that and, and having pigs and cows, but it's more really about the uh, fruit and vegetable home gardening. Uh, so, and, and the first column says uh, how much food how, how much of the food consumed in the household throughout the whole year is self-produced? So we see it's over one quarter and even over one third in the households of food growers. So those, those households, those households, sorry, growing food, they are able to produce in average over one quarter or, or over one third of their fruit and, and uh, vegetables. But not only they produce, they also received uh, some uh, receive some food like a gift or share, barter and whatever. That's the second column. So in, in general, you in the, th in the third column, you see how, how much of the fruit, vegetables and, and so on is, is bought in the shops which shows that 40% of vegetables and fruits in, in those households of growers is non-purchased. It did not went through the markets. It's not official, it's not taxed, you know, there's no, no like official, official market. It's not in the official statistics, in the market statistics. Okay, you say, but these are only the grower, growing households. If we will, use the same perspective but we will focus on all households not only growing but all households that's the table two we see that around 13 14 percent uh, in average now when when talking about the whole population is non non is self-produced and another few percent are gifted or shared so even in the whole population one fifth of fruit and vegetables is as well as eggs, potatoes, is non-market, is of non-market origin. So still, you know, quite, quite a lot. And in this paper, uh, we use these data to discuss the issue of the resilience 
uh, of the of the society, but not only as a passive resilience for times of shocks or uh, higher prices or lack of uh, lack of uh, production in in the official markets, uh, but uh, also for more active resilience and food growing. Uh, in, and spending time in gardens as some kind of resilience to and being outside of the official social systems, be it uh, socialist or capitalist mode of production uh, and so on. Uh, when continuing with this uh, amount of food, we could have also different perspective and that's more environmental one. Uh, in Journal of Cleaner Production, we asked what is the contribution of the gardeners towards env environmental sustainability. We took only those people who grow food again. So uh, you see in the table, we compared the active gardeners and general population according to their sociodemographics. Uh, gardening is very socially inclusive activity, but uh, in this data set, the gardeners were usually uh, a bit older, or we can say older people garden more often and garden more, probably because they have more time. And the average rate of self-sufficiency when thinking about the potatoes, vegetables, fruit of the food growing households is one third. That's what we've already seen. Uh, and if we will, uh, transpose this to the official statistics of food consumption uh, in home. This excludes restaurants, canteens, but this is what you eat at home, uh, vegetables, potatoes, fruit. That means that this one third of self-sufficiency uh, is approximately 44 kilograms per year, which is number supported by a different uh, type of qualitative studies. And we have uh, we transform it into the CO2 emissions, uh, CO2 mitigation potential according to a different uh, different uh, you know detail technical details of the of the calculation. It could be forty to ninety uh, CO2 uh, of uh, kilograms of CO2 uh, per person per year, which. In fact, it is one percent of household emissions, but could be ten percent of the of the overall food emissions. It doesn't look like that much, but uh, when discuss when you see the discussions about food emissions, uh, sometimes people really discuss about few percent uh, because uh, it contains uh, from the lot of very like uh, particular small steps. What's interesting from the env environmental perspective too, is that uh, when we ask the, for the rate of self-sufficiency and uh, the way how, they, how the fertilizers are used, we see that the groups of organic, of using only organic fertilizers like manure, compost, or using both organic and industrial, have higher production than uh, people who use no fertilizers. And in fact, people who use only industrial fertilizers, there is a wide, uh, there is a larger error because of a lower, lower number of the people. But when, when focusing only on, on vegetables, because it's a fruit is kind of like a different things. So when focusing only on vegetables, we see that the, the people are able, the growers are able to produce quite a lot more food with using only organic fertilizers than using only industrial fertilizers. And that is the answer to, the, to some questions of people who say, okay, but you know, the gardeners don't grow in environmentally friendly way always. Yes, of course, we know it. But in general, the big picture is that their uh, way of production is in general, environmentally sensitive. And this has to do also with their motivation. So if, you, if, we, if people were asked about their motivations, uh, they were able to, from the set of uh, four, five, six, seven, from nine 
uh, options to select top three uh, motifs for gardening. Environmental protection, like explicit environmental protection was at the bottom for almost all groups, uh, all, almost all social groups. Uh, while fresh food, healthy food was always on the top and financial savings and hobby were also quite important. And then there, there is this, the rest. So on one hand, uh, the explicit environmental protection is not important. On the other hand, uh, their behavior is environmentally friendly. And this is something what uh, Petri Helička labels as a quiet, like non-intentional sustainability. If uh, you would do some qualitative research, you will realize that when people talk about fresh and healthy food, some wider environmental motifs are almost always there, but they are very tightly linked with the healthy, healthy motifs and so on, so usually are not, not separated. And the last case, and I'm finally going to the some conclusions, is, uh, is about sharing. This time uh, only food sharing, but the sharing from uh, Sociologia Ruralis, uh, the paper of, of uh, my colleague Petri Elička and Petr Deněk. So I used their uh, outputs and tables uh, to illustrate the, how, how widespread food sharing is. So there were 2000 respondents and you can see in the, in the middle column that 28% uh, of the whole population both receives and gives some food. Uh, one third only receives, only very few only give, and uh, slightly more than one third does not participate in, in food sharing at all. So we see that uh, about 40% grows but 64% uh, shares. So there is also the, the circulation of food is much wider than only uh, around the growers. And we can also have a look who are the people who, who share. So the, the dark uh, part is give and receive, then in the middle is give only, very small, and the right one is receive only. So we see if we go from the from the top, both middle class, working class share in a very similar way. What's interesting is the, the income. People in the lowest quintile uh, give more often than people in the in the upper quintile, the in the the, the most rich. You know, then the education has a very marginal effect, almost no. And age again, you know, younger people more often share, more often receive, while older people more often give and receive. So the, the food in general flows from the uh, more like a rural region, more from the people with a lower income and older to their uh, families and friends who are better off, uh, younger, and more often in urban areas too. So it's a very, it's, it's kind of in the completely illogical from the economistic point of view. It, it makes no sense from the economic point of view, but it, is it like, like, it works uh, as it is. And uh, very similar patterns were, for example, uh, seen in, in Moldova in, in, a, in a very interesting study. When looking uh, for the uh, uh, geographic locations, you can also you can do this as well for uh, using the data. We see that uh, in a rural periphery, there is the lowest on the top row. There is the lowest number of people who who do not share at all. Then there is people who are sharing uh, less than one tenth. Then sharing more than one tenth and on the right you see people sharing more than one quarter of food that's quite a lot of food that you grow you know that's that's quite a high number mm, there are some like detailed differences so what's interesting in the bottom line major cities largest cities prague brno and, and the large uh, cities over 100,000 inhabitants 
there is highest uh, percentage of people who do not share at all, but there is highest people, highest percentage of people who share more than one quarter of food. And uh, again, in, in a larger cities, you usually grow less than in uh, rural areas because you have, uh, in, in average, you have a smaller garden and smaller land. So this shows there are some like a different patterns of food production and, and food sharing, probably less for own production and more for sharing, uh, more for like a social uh, sites, social bonds uh, and, and some like, you know, like a cultural value of this, of this sharing. So that's, uh, I, I wanted to share, <laughs> to share this. Uh, especially because of a different uh, regional typology, which could be done using the data. Motivations of food sharing, uh, why do people uh, share? So joy of pleasing other people, feeling good about gift. Uh, it is good when people can help each other, you know, to maintain good relation with friends and neighbors, enjoy time with friends very, very pro-social uh, motivation. That's, that's interesting too. And that's a very interesting aspect of the gardening and food sharing, uh, which is now quite of like uh, being analyzed and interpreted in the literature. So the, the, the final conclusions, uh, food gardening is a very socially inclusive and very stable activity in Czechia. There are these important aspects of caring, sharing, joy. Very often, or almost always, I think, uh, there, is, there are overlapping motivations of, uh, of gardening. People do it not only because one main motive. Uh, gardening is also very like, flexible. You can grow less one year, more next year. You grow because of different uh, motives. And is it, it's important uh, part of the alternative food networks, though it used to be underestimated, uh, especially in the Central European uh, area for some time, but uh, now it's, uh, it's changing. And to conclude this, I can show a recent uh, kind of like simplified <laughs> terminology of how food self-provisioning and growing can be interpreted in the literature, uh, which we did uh, this year with, uh, with colleagues uh, in a team led by P Petr Daniek. So we try to define uh, the, the types of uh, interpretations of food self-provisioning as some passive coping strategy of, of poor, then uh, different interpretation as a food growing as a cultural tra cultural tradition, often linked to rural areas, and more like a recent interpretation of food self provisioning as, as a hobby and a source of good food, which kind of fits well into what I was talking about, and most recently uh, interpreting food self provisioning as a as a transformative practice something which uh, has a potential to some active creative uh, performation and, and a change, which is probably most recent uh, interpretation, interpretation you can find in, a, in an academic literature about gardening. And the last one, so there will be some time for questions, I hope. Uh, I've shown three cases, but there's a lot of data. So what's still, uh, is not analyzed and can be, it's more, these are more these uh, aspects of help and sharing which are not related to food. There's a place for analyzing effects of sociodemographics, interaction between particular types of help, uh, relation between food growing and sharing uh, and, and help of different kind. Uh, there is uh, still space to do some detailed, more specifically focused analysis, focusing on some subgroups of different age, education, uh, geographic, locality subgroups. And all of these data, of course, can be used for various uh, theoretical considerations and interpretations. I've only slightly sketched a bit 
uh, when talking about uh, the previous slides. So I think it's a like there's still a lot of food for thought and data for sociology, economics, uh, environmental studies, agriculture studies, political ecology, and and so on and so on. There's interesting stream of literature on gardening uh, in a leisure studies, particularly, you know, and so. Uh, there, there are very interesting perspectives from the economic point of view, still pretty much opened. So that's it. And I hope that uh, the data which we used to analyze, and I think we probably did what we were able to do, will be useful for other researchers. And uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me or any of the co-authors I have I have mentioned for any ideas or support so thank you very much and here are some also some links to to on the bottom to this project and a similar project of a quiet sustainability focusing on a very uh, similar spheres so thank you thank you so much for your presentation I think that it was really a food for thought as you said um and yeah, now is the time for the questions, if anyone has any. Uh, and I'm going to give you some time to think about the questions. And I'm going to kick off with some of my own, if you allow me. Um, I was wondering um, if there are any statistics, if you know in which countries um, is gardening and food sharing the most, uh, which countries are most maybe famous or well known to like practice uh, gardening and food sharing? Are there any comparisons? Uh, well, um, uh, I think uh, if we will uh, make these statistics based on uh, on uh, academic research, it's uh, Czechia. I think that uh, like uh, when considering uh, how how many people grow food, uh, and when we consider how much the the uh, to what extent the, the growers, the gardeners are uh, risk being researched, Czechia is powerhouse of the food uh, research. So, but in, in general, if you will have a look uh, on a whole Central Europe, uh, the numbers are very, very similar. For example, and even if you, if you have a look into the Western Europe, we did research in Aberdeenshire in Scotland. For me, this is a place uh, which is quite cold and not very like not the best place for gardening, but uh, one third of people is, is growing food there as well. You know, in Ohio, in US, uh, which has a uh, 10 million of, of people, uh, it was very similar. I think it was 40% of people in Ohio are gardening. You know, so there is you, you find gardeners uh, everywhere. That's very interesting. And also, uh, I was thinking if there's maybe some uh, international data that would allow for a comparison, or are the data just country specific? Mm, well, I think there are no. Uh, there used to there, there was some uh, some research using the some European statistics data, maybe from two thousand five or something about that uh which uh which showed the the european uh perspective and uh, the the, re the result was in general that in in eastern like in former eastern europe uh, there's more gardening than, than than in the west but even in in the west for example in luxembourg there was quite a lot of gardeners you know so but but uh, as as far as i know there is no like really global uh, research uh, uh, like asking for, for gardening. That's a shame, maybe in the future then. <laughs> hope so. <laughs> um, I still don't really see any questions in the chat or from the participants, um, but I still have one more question sure. if, I, if I can, um, because I, I really enjoyed your presentation and this is okay. all very new to me, to, to be honest. I'm not really... Um, uh, yeah, knowledgeable about this uh, topic. Um, it was very interesting to me to see that financial savings were the third reason uh, on the scale that you showed. And I wonder if that's really true, because 
for me, but maybe it's just from my perspective. It feels like it's more of a hobby than financial savings, but yet hobby was on the fourth place and financial savings were on the third place. Um, it, because, you know, you need to buy plants and um, you have to pay for the water and fertilizer and it's a time investment as well. So I wonder if it's really true, but maybe this is more of a, uh, you know, just something to think about. It would be very interesting to see um, some sort of research that would maybe count the real uh, expenses yep. regarding time and financial resources and compare that to the perceived, um, yeah, yeah, to what people perceive about. Uh, yeah, well, that's, <laughs> I think that that's a big question. There is a research like this. I, I think that there is some in UK and uh, I'm sure in Australia, there is a research in which they really try to calculate the, the the financial uh, how the, the investment and then the potential savings but i think it's complicated because uh, um, this was 2015 data i think in more recent 2020 data the financial savings was on a fourth place and the hobby was on a third place but in general if we have a look into the last 15 or 20 years these four uh, motifs which i have highlighted are always for the fresh and healthy food is always number one and two and the uh, hobby and financial motives is always number three or four and they switch you know the position uh, for let's say that for some social groups the financial motives are more important than for the others that, that's that's for sure uh, for let's say older people who have uh, more time this could be let's say more more often mentioned but even for those it isn't usually number one it's usually number three or four you know after the fresh and and healthy food which in self itself has inside some joy of growing and and so on and the question of finance of course it depends but if you don't calculate your time let's say especially given that you it's not uh, not a trade-off between your work and your gardening time because uh, usually people won't spend the two hours uh, per day of gardening in other more work you know so that, that doesn't work like this so if you don't calculate this time then it usually is some you know uh, financial financial savings that's that's true but uh, the fact that it saves you some money does not mean that it's a primary motivation. It's more like a side effect of uh, of the joy of gardening. Thank you. Unfortunately, I don't see any questions in the chat um, or think, any raised hands. <laughs> but uh, I think that the time's up uh, anyway. Oh, maybe especially uh, the, the Czech, Czech colleagues all know, <laughs> know this, so it's <laughs> um, better. Actually, yeah. Uh, please ask. Hi, everyone. Um, I mean, this was quite empirical at the end, the, the discussion. But I think what's interesting is that that is like a you know, there is a pos possibility or potential to develop some kind of theoretical insights out of it as well. And so what, what caught my attention is the notion of resilience and, and the kind of the relationship between food provisioning or self-food provisioning and resilience. Um, and I find it quite complicated or difficult to, 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 to grasp how do, you, how, do you, how do you think through the relationship between resilience and self-provisioning self of food. Uh, resilience for which system or for whom who's resilient what's resilient in what ways what does it mean to be resilient and 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 you know what's the unit towards which the resilience is being considered is it like the garden the, the society the individual people families um, and because this makes the kind of thinking about resilience very complicated and and the other thing is well is is it the kind of a productive framework to think think uh, you know the the, the self-provisioning as something that can help us with you know understanding resilience or whatever or is is, is productive to think through resilience mm -hmm. these practices yep thank you uh, yeah just, just yeah, yeah 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 well th thank you peter Peter. Uh, yeah you're you're right uh, there is a yeah the resilience is kind of like a, it has a lot of lot of meanings i would i would 
talk about the two examples, I would say. Uh, one, one resilience on a, on a individual level, which uh, means uh, in, in particularly, and I think this was in, in, in the paper I, I mentioned, uh, Petr Jehlička uh, knows more than me because he, he was the one who, who made, made uh, much more about the theory. But the, the idea is that individual, when, is, uh, when uh, you as an individual has more sources of food, if I make it a bit practical, if you have a more sources of food, you are more resilient. Because if you rely only on shops, you, are, you uh, rely on what will happen, let's say, during COVID when the, when the trade doesn't work and so on. If you would be 100% relying only on your garden, that's not resilient at all because you are relying only on only on one sources but if you have a more sources like you you earn your money and you buy some food then you have your time and your garden so you can grow some food then you maybe have uh, maybe you can change or barter some food with your neighbors then you have a variety of sources of uh, of food and you are able to balance when one source is problematic, when there is a shortage and so on. Similarly, I would say, uh, and this was the, the paper of Bartel and, and colleagues is quite, I think, famous in this perspective. Uh, you can think about the resilience of, let's say, city. It's often in, a, in a urban areas that the, the city, which in 20th century uh, changed to the area which is totally depending on external inputs of energy and food. So if you are able to grow some food itself, then you are increasing the, the resilience. And in this perspective, I'm always thinking about two preconditions you need to have. One precondition is a know-how. Mm. You need people to know how to garden, which still continues uh, now and even if you have a very small garden, you usually know how to do it, how to do the basics. You know, in in United Kingdom in World War II, people had to know how to change their parks into the carrot fields and so on. And the second point is, you have to have the parks, you have to have allotment gardens, you have to have the place, some green place which is not sealed with buildings and concrete and and so on. So. And you can, you're right, you can have a resilience of individual, of neighborhood, of a city, of, uh, of, a, of a country. And it's more than just a self-sufficiency. You know, it's uh, because to be resilient does not need to, does not need to mean to be self-sufficient, but you have to have some ways which will substitute the shortages and so on. And in this paper, uh, we went, and even even further beyond this and talk about some like a uh, individual's resilience is more like a resistance uh, not to be part of a dominant let's say mainstream socialist market mainstream you know to have some place and so but but you're right you, you have to define uh, what kind of uh, resilience do, do we mean okay yep thank you Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think that the time is up now and we should uh, give the floor to Radka. Thank you so much, Jan, uh, for joining us and for your presentation. Um, so I want to introduce our last presenter, who is Radka Hanslova. She's a PhD student in sociology at the Faculty of Arts of Charles University, and she is uh, soon to defend her thesis focused on measurement equivalence of well-being in the European Social Survey. Good luck with that. Uh, she also works as a researcher at the Public Opinion Center of the Institute of Sociology of the Czech Academy of Sciences, once again, uh, where she deals with the research topic food waste as a global and local problem and uh, she will tell us a little more about environmental behavior of Czech households and individuals. Um, so please, uh, the floor is now yours. You're muted, uh, Radka. Yeah, thank you for a nice introduction. I will share my screen. Uh, do you see my presentation in the full view or not? Uh, not the full view. 
yeah, I will just once again. Now, is it okay? Yes, it's working. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for the invitation once again, and I will start right away. I'm very pleased to present here my presentation with the title Environmental Behavior of Czech, of Czech Households and Individuals with a Focus on Food Waste. Uh, let's start my presentation in general. Food waste is a big problem in the present that has economic, ecological, ethical and social impacts. As is evident from the title of my presentation, I will focus mainly on the ecological impact of uh, ecological impact in relation to food waste, respectively the activities and behaviors of individuals and households that are related to it. I will introduce several topics that affect our environment ecological impact. In my presentation, I will first briefly introduce each topic and then on the representative Czech data, I will show you how is the situation in the Czech Republic. Before that, I very quickly give you some general facts about food waste in relation to its environmental impact and also present the surveys whose results I will present. I will end my presentation with a short summary. So just to start with a few numbers, which are very important for the context. Around one third of all food is wasted worldwide, which is 1.3 billion tons. That is an amount that would feed up to 3 billion people while approximately 8 a uh, hundred million people in the world suffer from hunger and malnutrition. With the wasted food come huge financial losses uh, that reach almost a trillion dollars. According to estimate from European Union, the most food waste occurs at the household level, which estimates of 53%. In my presentation, I will therefore uh, focus specifically on individuals and households and their food related activities that can reduce their environmental impact. Uh, also, it is important to remember that when we throw food away, we are not just throwing that specific food, but we are also wasting all the resources that are needed to produce it, such as water, energy and land. Specifically, according to Food and Agricultural Organization, food waste is responsible for 8% of total greenhouse gas emission. As for the water, annually, it is wasted for food production as much as three times the volume of Lake Geneva. And in terms of land, almost 30% of world's agricultural land is used to produce food that is thrown away. The solution to the food waste is very complex, but each of, each of us can contribute uh, to it by our behavior, respectively, what we eat, what, the, what and how we buy, how we travel, what products we use in our home, and so on. I will present some of ways in which each of us can reduce our burden on the environment in my presentation. But first, I, will, I would like to briefly introduce the survey whose results I will present. The first survey is called Food, which is carried out within the framework of the research program of Strategy of Academy of Sciences 22, Food for the Future from 1917. From this survey, we have very valuable data on the specific topic because we have long time series and we can monitor uh, the development and changes in people's opinion. Each survey covers many topics, some of which you can see on this slide, and some of these results I will present uh, lately. The second source of the data is, is survey Our Society, which is conducted several times a year, and which year 
um, which each year includes topics on ecology, environment, climate change, and much, and much more. Both surveys have the same technical parameters. They are carried out by the Public Opinion Research Center of the Czech Academy of Sciences on a representative sample of the Czech population over 15 years through face-to-face -face interviews. The research sample consists approximately of 1,000 respondents. They are selected by a quota method according to gender, gender age, education, region, and size of place of the residents. From both surveys, the results are uh, elaborated into press releases that are publicly available on our websites. As for the source data, it is stored in, in the Czech Social Science Data Archive. And now to the results. I would start with the general questions on how the Czech public views food waste. From this graph, we can see that according to the latest survey from this year, almost one, half of respondents consider food waste uh, to be a big problem. And another 54% of respondents see food waste as something wrong, but also see more urgent problem to be solved. Over uh, from time comparison, we don't see much change, but in, in, this, in, in this survey from this year, we note that the highest severity of the problem of food waste. Let's continue with people general environmental mindset. In this survey, we ask respondents whether the environmental impact of food they buy and eat is important to them. From, as you can see from this graph, according to the latest survey, 51% uh, for 51% for of respondents, it is important. And for 55%, it is not, is, isn't important. These results are not bad, but they don't manifest into specific shopping food behavior into what people buy food on. In this graph, we can see that it is clearly show that the price is the most important factor for shopping food, followed by ingredients and origin. On the other hand, how the food or its ingredients were grown and how it is packaged is almost not at all important for the Czech respondents. In the context of food waste, the term ecological footprint is used. This includes the more familiar carbon footprint, but also biodiversity, maintenance, and landscape protection. As consumers, we have the most power to influence our carbon footprint. Just for clarification, carbon footprint of food reflects reflects the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that are produced across the entire life cycle of food, from the production and the processing of the food and its ingredients to the food transports and the emission produced by the disposal of its packaging. A very simple and measurable way in which every person can reduce the carbon footprint of their food is through eating diet. Meat and dairy products have the highest carbon footprint, but for example, also chocolate, but while the lowest carbon footprint have fruits, vegetables, and nuts. According to the research conducted by Arnica, a Czech nonprofit organization in 2018 of, on the residents of Prague, it has been clearly shown that people who eat a plant-based diet or try to reduce the consumption of meat and dairy products have a significant have significantly lower carbon footprint. These results are in, are in line with other international studies. 
Indeed, switching uh, to a plant-based diet, it, it is considered one of the most effective tools for struggling with climate change. The popularity of plant-based diet in the world is growing. Year 2019 has been named the year of veganism by the Economist magazine. According to the survey by Ipsos from 2018, in the world was 73% omnivores, 14% flexitarian, who are the people who are reducing the consumption of meat and dairy products, 5% vegetarian, 3% vegan, and 3% people who eat only fish. In the Czech Republic, Although the demand for plant-based alternative of meat and dairy product is growing, the number of people who are on plant-based diet uh, or reduce the consumption of meat and dairy product is very low. According to our latest survey, 90% of respondents said uh, that they eat all without restriction. They are on regular food and only 2% said that they are vegetarian. The rest of respondents, the res the rest of respondents uh, reported other style of eat, style of eating. In our survey, we also focused on the food-related activities and behaviors of individuals and households that also affect their carbon footprint. In the questionnaire, we presented respondents a battery of several statements for which they answer on five-point response scale how often they do them. As you can see from this graph, the vast majority of respondents regularly buy food or buy food on food in their own bag and also prefer to food produced in the Czech Republic. A relatively high percentage of respondents also try to avoid single use plastic products and also use their own refillable bottle for drinks. On the other hand, at least people buy organic food. Another activity how we can reduce the burden on the environment is proper food waste management of organic of organic waste. If we have to throw, if, if we have to throw this type of food away, it, it's not good to throw it into the mixed communal waste, but to compost it. According to the statistic from 2020, almost one quarter of mixed communal waste uh, is made up of organic waste, which doesn't belong there. Our survey revealed that half of, half, of, half of Czech people regularly composting with 31% always, 14% often, and 13% sometimes. On the contrary, approximately one third of respondents declared that they never compost. Regarding the method used to sorting organic waste, the most common is garden composting, followed by public brown bin waste containers, uh, which, are, which are in some towns for free. Method for composting in households, such as vermicomposting or bokashi composting, are rarely used in the Czech households, but it's very great method for people living in flats without garden. Finally, in my presentation, I would like to look at the activities that are not directly to the food waste, but to environmental sustainability in general. These data are from the survey Our Society from the last year. Respondents were presented several sustainable activities and asked to indicate how often they do them. The results are shown in this graph. It shows that people clearly do most often sort general waste followed by sorting dangerous waste. Around three fifths, three fifths of people save energy and water for the environment and also buy local food. On the other hand, only one fifth of people reduce the car driving for the sake of the environment. And 
Finally, some briefly conclusion. Food waste is a major global problem that has environmental, economic, and social impacts. Given that the people uh, waste the most, the solution to this problem should start with everyone. It's therefore important that everyone start take some steps because every step count and in the overall picture it it will have a big impact. Keep in mind that when we throw food away, we are not just throwing that particular food, but we are also uh, wasting all the resources that are needed to produce it. Plan, educate yourself, take an interest, pass the information by locally and sustainably, reduce consumption of meat and dairy products, and in short, set an example for others. We can all start with small, simple changes that are simple and cost us nothing, but which in turn will do a lot for ever for our planet, because we have only one planet, and we should keep this in our minds. Our, our minds. And that would be all from me. And thank you for no attention. And I we, and we can discuss it about some of your questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. I really like the Vogue uh, tone of your presentation and that it has some practical implications and suggestions. Uh, and I hope that we will have some questions now, either from the chat or um, you can raise a hand. Okay, uh, Petr Gibas has a uh, question, please feel free yeah. to ask. Um, maybe this is a stupid question, but, but the data is, is really fascinating. But one, one thing I noticed is that the, the, the most economically expensive options are the least used, you know, buy organic food, but organic food is quite expensive. So, so do we have any data about who are, I mean, what kinds of people socioeconomically speaking do these types of, you know, practices? <gasps> We can still hear you. I don't exactly, I think, I don't know <laughs> on, on the question I, I really should answer because I think that Peter um, didn't say whole questions. Okay, I'm not sure if we should wait for um, better or not. Maybe, maybe there's some other question in the meantime before he manages to reconnect. <laughs> um, or if not, then maybe I can ask some questions because I have some. Uh, I was wondering how is the Czech Republic uh, doing in an uh, international context? Do we have some comparisons with uh, other countries uh, regarding food waste maybe? Are we the worst uh, or amongst the best or somewhere in the middle? Do you know this by any chance? Yeah, uh, measuring food waste is quite problematic because it exists uh, many methods that Simply, we cannot uh, compare uh, the different methods between. For example, it exists direct methods for measuring food waste, which are the most precise, but also uh, it is very cost in terms of finance times uh, at much more. Uh, the other methods, for example, are food waste diaries or, for example, questionnaire, but these methods are isn't so reliable. Uh, from this year, uh, the all, can, all European Union countries have, the, have to report it, the food waste on the, during the whole cycle whole cycle of food from production to the household level and the European Union setting um, a methodology that on that we can much better compare the level of food waste in the in the countries. So I hope that in this year when the results uh, will be presented, we will have much more information. But now um, I think that, yeah, of course it exists some 
estimates in how much food wasted in different countries, but these results are some in some countries the results are high confidence on the contrary in some low confidence so it's uh, very difficult to compare the countries between uh, between them but in the czech republic i have to say that we have um, quite quite good data because the research team from uh, Mendel University in Brno do, uh, have a research project where, uh, in which they're uh, conducting a direct measuring and it was very valuable data for food waste. Thank you. And uh, Patrick Gubas is back. And I think that he was wondering uh, regarding the uh organic food that not all the people maybe have the option to buy organic food if i understood correctly and he was wondering about the socio demographics of the people who uh practice this uh so maybe if you have some more information on that if there are people economic, you know the, the the kind of economic you know who, who i mean economically speaking or socio economically speaking who are those people what kind of practices are those practices socio-economically conditioned and how on, do we know that and don't we know that i don't know just wondering uh, do you mean a socio-demographic characteristic of people who are buying uh, organic food no i mean in general i mean how are those like practices like you know food waste management and so on are they socio-economically conditioned you know do we know that i mean you know if poor people throw less food or you know and it or you know Yes, we look at it. Um, I don't know exactly. Uh, we all presented in our press releases and we doing this type of analysis, uh, mainly according to education, gender, uh, income, uh, um, and so on. But I, uh, if I remember, um, uh, very often there are not much uh, the statistically significant differences. Uh, you are muted, uh, Petr. Oh, you... that's, okay. <laughs> that's quite interesting. I uh, wonder if it's a matter of the, um, you know, of how many people were asked and so on, or, or whether it's like more general thing, because it sounds quite interesting then, isn't it? Or doesn't it? Yeah, uh, but also it's, it's sometimes quite difficult because, for example, buying organic food, this category has a very small percentage of people so the comparison is quite uh, is um, from methodological point of view very problematic because these group are isn't uh, clearly comparable because just one is very small and the second is uh, very very big thank you uh, and i have one last question. I'm wondering if it's really a question. I was just uh, thinking because it was quite surprising to me that only 2% uh, of the sample stated that they were vegetarians. So I was wondering maybe this is an, maybe this is um, an issue of how the question was posed to the respondents. Um, um, you know, I'm, I'm just uh, wondering, maybe people are not really restricted. Um, they are not like strict vegetarians, but maybe they just prefer a certain type of diet. Um, um, and also maybe this depends on uh, the place where they live. Like I can imagine that in villages or small towns, it, it can be quite difficult to uh, be a vegetarian if there are no like restaurant options or not, no really. Um, yeah, th this was just something that I was thinking about. I'm not uh, honestly sure if this is really a question. <laughs> you are right. Uh, I was also surprised uh, by these results because I also say I also think that the percentage of people who are vegetarian or at least reducing the consumption of meat and dairy product is growing, but our survey uh, doesn't confirm that. I don't know. I, I don't know why. But yeah, I, uh, I have the same 
same questions or same thing as you? Um, this is probably the last chance for a question if someone from the audience wants to ask something. Or you can maybe contact uh, Radka by email if you have any additional questions. Um, anyways, uh, thank you so much for taking part in uh, the webinar. Uh, I think that it was very interesting, at least to me. I hope uh, you had the same notion. Um, and as I said at the very beginning, we will send out uh, the slides, links uh, to the slides and to the recording. And I hope uh, to see you maybe sometime in the future on some other webinars. So thank you so much for the lectures and also to the audience. Have a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.